Have you ever been sat watching the Olympics or the Rugby World Cup or the Premier League and thought to yourself, I could have done that if I tried? Well, I was wondering, with the constantly controversial topic of nature versus nurture, and with all our recent scientific leaps in understanding DNA, just how true is that? You see, when I think about your top athletes, and I'm talking about your Usain Bolts, your Michael Phelps, your Paula Radcliffe's, people at the top of their field, I can't help but think whether or not they're so good because of their training, their physical similarities, or whether being good is just, as they say, in their blood. Hang on a second. Chaps, make sure you get it all the way around, yeah? Got it. Yeah. Let's take four of the world's top footballers as an example. Here we have Cristiano Ronaldo, Lionel Messi, Harry Kane and Neymar. And where they're all top of their games, they actually share relatively little in common physically. Their heights vary between 6 foot 2 and 5 foot 7, they're all widely different weights, and their shoe sizes show little consistency with their differing body types. Apart from Harry Kane, whose shoe size is surprisingly hard to find, but that's beside the point. By looking at him, Cristiano Ronaldo, for example, has a body type that is predominantly mesomorphic, which is characterised as a body with high metabolism, low body fat, and highly responsive muscular cells, stereotypically leading to broad shoulders and well-built, good muscle growth. But he also has a few characteristics of an ectomorph, which are typically skinnier, lean builds that are also low fat, but struggle to build muscle. Lionel Messi seems to actually have the reverse characteristics. Why is this important? Well, the difference between knowing or not knowing about ecto, meso and endomorph body types can be the difference between getting faster physical results or none at all. Because science has shown that each individual somatotype responds differently to the same training and nutrition. It is, however, important to point out that although there are these three very clear somatotypes, people are almost always a combination and can actually transition back and forth between them too. So the main thing is to know what training to do and what to eat, depending on which body type you lean towards the most. There you go. Thanks chaps, you go. and uh, if you can get them off to Sebastian, he's expecting them. Uh, Rory and Sam, these guys are from the YouTube channel Rebel FC, and they've kindly volunteered to remind me as a man of science that as men of sport, there's much more to being successful than just physical fitness. So Rory, say I want to become a professional footballer, what should I do? So when it comes to talent and technique, a player's relationship with the ball is key. So understanding every time you take a little kick or a little touch, the ball reacts differently every single time. Right, so every time you kick the ball and you make the ball move, from a scientific point of view, we're basically looking at Newton's third law of motion. Yeah, and if you wanted to apply that to football, for example, dribbling drills is the most perfect way to do that. So you're moving at speed, you're changing direction quickly, you're taking loads of little touches, and you're also keeping the ball under control at all times. Uh, but that's the short stuff, but then you also need to understand that you need to kick a ball long distance sometimes. And imagine you're running into the box, the keeper's in your way, you've got to score. What could you do? Curl it. Exactly. So we can place the ball anywhere we like. We're gonna use here for now. So we're gonna come back on roughly a 45 degree angle. David Beckham liked to go on a wider angle to the football, but more neutral is better if you're just learning to curl the ball and get the maximum contact you want. You don't want to be too straight, because that means you're going to hit the ball in the dead center. So, if we're going to curl it over to the left-hand side and get that spinning over to the left, we're going to kick to the right-hand side of the ball. For the in-step free kick, obviously we're going to use normally the big toe here, and obviously that will allow us maximum effect to curl the ball. So if you've got the right technique, the ball should be spinning from the momentum that you've created from your strike. And from there, this really cool thing called the Magnus Effect takes over. The Magnus Effect describes what happens when a force affects a cylindrical or spherical object. In essence, as air approaches the ball, it passes from the front to the back around a thinner cushion of air. If the ball is spinning from the initial motion, that oncoming air will follow the direction of the spin because that's the side producing the least friction. It'll accelerate around the ball and as the oncoming air approaches the opposite side of the spin, it meets that residual opposing air which causes it to slow down and go straight. This causes a buildup of air pressure in the space between them, creating an airflow in one direction and in turn forcing the ball to move in the other. 
This is Newton's third law of motion in action. So based on what we know, physical ability isn't the be all and end all of sporting success. You do have to train your body in order to compete, but you have to practice those skills and techniques in order to perform them effectively. Now, this is the point where I have to ask whether or not your DNA can have any effect on your ability. Are you born good? Earlier on, I asked Rory and Sam to swab their mouths. Those swabs absorb saliva, and in that saliva are traces of their DNA. Now, we sent that DNA off for testing for specific genes to help us understand whether their genetic makeup can affect their ability on the pitch. Hello. Hi Seb, it's Dom here. Um, I've got Rory and Sam with me. They're very eager to find out their results, but before we do that, can you just tell us exactly what you're testing for? Yeah, sure. So when we get the samples through, we look at uh, genes relating to different physical traits, which the, we then compress into a number of panels. Uh, these are things like training intensity response, which is the kind of training style people best respond to, uh, aerobic trainability, recovery speed, and also things like soft tissue injury risk. So what we're looking for is a set of genes that have a proven evidence base relating to the particular trait we're looking at, because single genes in isolation can't tell you that much. We look at about 15 genes, which we then weigh the net effect of to give you a simple output score. So in the example of training intensity response, we look at things like ACTN3 or ACE, which influence the kind of muscle fiber you can build and therefore whether you're more prone to sort of power response or endurance response. Right, okay, so from those scores, you're able to do what exactly? We personalize your training protocol and training style to a way that's gonna be in line with your genetic predispositions. So in the case of training intensity response, we can move you to a training style that we know you're going to get quicker results from. Right, so that means that hypothetically, if these guys didn't have those genes, that they could still improve on their performance? Yeah, definitely. The genes just influence what the best route to those improvements might be. Uh, and nutrition is something else that's really important. So can we help improve people's recovery with the right nutrients? Or can we get people to their target weight uh, more easily by balancing out the carbs and fats? Sam, you come back as what we call a mixed responder. So you have a 50-50 split between power and endurance response, uh, and this is because you carry the mixed version of the, the ACTN3 gene, which is commonly called the sprint gene, uh, the ACE gene as well. So you have some mixed versions here that mean you adapt well to both kinds of training styles. So really what you want to be doing with this is training across the intensity spectrum. So high intensity style includes things like sprints, uh, heavy weights, jumps, that's going to improve your speed and power. Uh, and then on the other side of things, endurance is more longer, steady state work. Uh, and what that's going to do is help you keep that performance going for 90 minutes. I already implement that into my training. What about nutrition? I currently avoid bread and pasta because of their high glucose content. From your genetic predispositions, that looks like exactly what you should be doing. So you've come back as actually having a higher sensitivity to carbohydrates. Uh, in particular refined carbohydrates, so when carbs are higher in the diet, you're going to get more of an effect on things like blood glucose levels. You've also got a raised need for a number of nutrients, including vitamin D, vitamin B and also omega-3. Uh, you're a fast metabolizer of caffeine, meaning you break it down quickly, uh, and you have a raised sensitivity to the effects of alcohol, meaning you're going to get things like worse hangovers. And Seb, what about Rory? Are there any real differences in his results? Yeah, so the two of you are actually quite similar. But Rory, you've come back with a slightly stronger bias towards power activities. Uh, your recovery speed has come back as medium, so that means uh, about 48 hours rest between the hardest sessions would be ideal. Uh, and your injury risk is normal, so sort of standard prehab protocol should apply. Your micronutrient needs are for the most part normal, uh, but you do have a raised need for omega-3. So it looks like that you guys have different training needs, so maybe you go off and do that and I'll finish this phone call with Seb. Okay, one last thing before I let you go, Seb. Now, clearly there's benefits to studying DNA of athletes, but aren't there some ethical issues around it? I mean, what if those guys were put off by their results? The genes you have shouldn't change your goal or, or what you're trying to achieve. Actually, they're just an opportunity to tailor the training that you're doing towards that goal in a way that's personalized to you. And actually, a good example of this is Andrew Steele, one of the co-founders of DNA Fit. So he's one of the 3% of elite sprinters that don't have the so-called sprint gene. Uh, and actually, if this had been presented to him in the wrong way, he may never have gone on to win bronze at the Beijing Olympics. And that's why we have a strict policy 
of no direct testing of people under the age of 18, uh, unless it's coming through a, a professional sports setup. And even then, the information has to be communicated through the coaching team rather than direct to the players. All right, great. Thanks for your time, Seb. So there are definitely some benefits to testing for your genetic predispositions. But as we saw with you guys, you don't need to test your genes to know how different things affect your body. That's because simply, if you're good at something, you tend to do more of it. So if you play on the wing in football, you tend to focus on more of your speed and your endurance. But if you're not as fast, uh, you may be more inclined to work on your skill and your technique. That being said, even if you do have great genes, you have to work incredibly hard to be a high level competitor. So having those genes doesn't necessarily mean you're going to make it. You still have to work hard. So if you're looking to become a top athlete, but you can't fit into your genes and you don't have a coach to help you figure out why, then maybe you need to look at your genes. So what do you think about DNA testing in sport? Do you approve of it? Or do you think it's cheating? Maybe you think you've got some magical gene that makes you incredibly strong like the Hulk. Spoiler, probably not. Anyway, let us know in the comments below. And until next time, thanks to the guys from Rebel FC for helping us out with this video. Hit that like button and don't forget to subscribe to Earth Lab for more science videos.